We're live. Uh, so hello, Interwebs. 
Uh, thanks everybody who can join us this evening. Uh, this is streaming live right now, and it will be archived to our YouTube channel where you can find previous month's talks. We've got about 30 or 40 days there, going back a couple years, which is great. Um, we don't have any mics tonight, so speakers definitely try to speak up. And if you have questions, um, try to repeat the questions uh, so that the laptop picks them up and the people on the interwebs can hear. Um, we're doing pretty well chair-wise, but if, uh, if folks are struggling or standing, we can bring in a couple more chairs from out there. And uh, we ask this question every month. How many people here are here at an event for the very first time? First time in WS. Welcome. Welcome. We're glad you could join us. Thank you. We're coming up on 4,600 people now, I think. Which is yeah. insane. Um, and uh, something else we also do every month is uh, who here is hiring? Who here is looking to hire people? <laughs> yes. So we heard from Mixo already. Do you, you want to go first? Uh, so uh, where do you work and the position you work for? Hello, uh, Brian Amy. Uh, we're looking for a UI uh, slash UX designer. I need to be cool. Hey, I'm Miles at uh, M Digital. I'm head of design. I'm looking for UX and UI designers, just mid level and even junior. I'd love to help teach people. Um, so just contact me if you can. Second is the World Information Architecture Day DC. Uh, it's 25 bucks for the day, some great speakers. If you want to check that event out? Uh, I think we're going to post the links to it on our social media channels. If you want to check that out? Next month's event, we haven't done this one before, uh, the business side of starting a freelance uh, design organization. Uh, and Joanna Ostrich is going to be doing that tentatively March 18th. We're still nailing down the date and location, um, but that's pretty cool. That's a new topic for us. That'll be so, details aside, uh, room to work. So, uh, so as product teams uh, grow and we all do more and more sophisticated product development, uh, there's a tremendous amount of interest in design systems. We've had a couple of events now about design systems. This is kind of continuing that conversation. Uh, so how can we work more efficiently? How can we focus on customers and business problems instead of pushing pixels and punching code? Uh, so tonight, we have three speakers joining us. Um, Hannah's going to kick it off. She's VP of Design and Product Experience at Leverage, uh, talking about design system adoption. Uh, Vlad Korbov in the back, Sketch Ambassador, Product Analyst, and, and Audioverse. Not anymore. Old. Not anymore. I'll, I'll let you do Freelancing, guys. Freelancing. Okay, all right. No Mac Lins, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, he's going to be talking about organizing your design system in Sketch. Yeah. Getting, getting dirty. Practical stuff. Practical stuff. And then finally, Miles. Uh, Miles Kemp's going to be talking, head of design at digital, is going to be talking about accelerating the impact of design systems across large organizations, which is an interesting challenge. So uh, ask questions as we go. Speakers, please repeat the questions so the interrupts can hear. And uh, we'll have time at the end if anybody has some extra follow up questions. Uh, and uh, so if we have three speakers tonight, I'll kind of keep the ball rolling along. And uh, so without further ado, yeah. Yeah, and if at any point I'm not talking loud enough, please just let me know and I will try to speak louder. And so what I put together is, this is basically the decision framework my team went through as we built out our design system. It's been processed for about four years and it's evolved a lot over those four years as we went from one designer to six designers and then to letting actual designers at other companies use our design system to build their own products. And so what I'm going to do is break down the process that we took and then show you a little bit about our design system and the background of what the company does so that you understand what context we were trying to solve this problem in. So just a brief overview of Leverage. We're an IoT solutions development platform. We have our own internal platform suite, which enables us to quickly build and execute IoT solutions for customers. 
some of those solutions, examples that I'll give out, just so you can get a nice framework in your mind, they're all within asset tracking and remote monitoring. One that I'm working on is for PetSmart. It's tracking pets that get checked in for pet hotels and grooming and things like that, and knowing where they are in the process, what their status is, their heart rate, when they go to the bathroom, what store, like what store they're in, what room they're in. And then another is actually hospital equipment <laughs> tracking for a 54 hospital. So knowing where the IV pumps are, the patient beds are, wheelchairs, all the expensive equipment that moves and sometimes gets lost and nurses can't find them when they need them. And on top of that, it even has a quarantine management system. And so those sound like very different products, but they have a lot of the same underlying framework because you're tracking mobile assets through a web application. And so what we've done at Leverage is we've built this underlying solution that solves remote, man like remote monitoring, remote management, and then asset tracking needs. And then started building out a system where we could easily customize that framework to our customers. And so our design system has to be able to be easily white labeled, easily take on another client's brand for their products, but also serve the same framework of good UX patterns that we built into our base platform. So I, that's a little complicated, and I'm happy to explain more. Play a nice platform video we have that might explain it better than words, but I won't go into that unless you ask. So where our design system comes into our process, this is pretty routine, essentially empathize and define. So we do user research. We sit down with the customers, do what the user needs. We go on site, learn about their operations and their processes, and then when we start ideating and prototyping, is when we start incorporating our design system because our design based system is actually a wireframe system again. So all great scale. As soon as we move from low-fi to high-fi, we start using our component library. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we actually have, we use Figma, but we have a theme file that we can apply to that component library that automatically updates all the typography, draft shadows, border radius, and colors, and logo. And then that will update, that gets to maybe 60% of the way there in visual design. There's a lot of the smaller pieces of like, what does alert iconography mean? How are you displaying the information the right way? That's the hard part, but this is the easy part and it gets you. So, starting off, we did not start here <laughs> by any means. Um, when I first started at Leverage, Leverage started as a small software startup. Um, I was the only designer. I had a UI kit file that I used and I just duplicated it and sketched for all of my projects because I was working on a ton of different client products and there were eight people. And so that's where we started. That's the design system we had at that point. It was really just a UI kit for rapid development and a startup lifestyle. Uh, from there, every time we've added a new designer, we've started incorporating how do we make this work between designers. And then about two years ago, we sat down with the chief architect of the platform and decided to approach design development handoff in a new way. And that incorporated saying like, what are the actual pain points between designers and developers? Not just the design system or like corresponding with a component-based, like code-based component system, but what are the real pain points? Like where do we keep sinking time and a lot of that was like, hey, this button padding is off by two pixels, or that border radius is wrong, or that drop shadow is wrong. And we were losing a lot of time there mm -hmm. because we are really building these products and design QA testing that communication was just a time sink. So how we approached our design system, which has evolved a lot, it started off as UI kit, and then essentially it's become a much larger integrated platform. It's a piece of our platform now, which I will get there when I get there, but we'll start easy. <laughs> So first, what I did with the Chief Architect is we sat down and we said, who are our users, right? Because, and this is important for anybody trying to get buy-in for their design system or their company, like, what is the purpose and what is the point? We went to the CEO and we said, hey, we think if we build this combina com combination of a component-based system that the developers use that corresponds to our design system, we can cut down, the cut down our time on sprints and half. Like we think we can just eliminate a ton of unnecessary work when you're like fiddling with buttons again for the upteenth time or you're fiddling with another table. We were like, we think we can really solve this. We're getting to the point where we were at 15 people then and we said, we want to make our processes better. And so from that, they greenlighted the project and then we started sitting down with the designers and the engineers, watching what they were doing and how they were using the current systems we had in place. The engineers at that point didn't have a component system. <laughs> they built everything from scratch every time, which was wild, as you might imagine, some of your facial expressions. Yeah, it was wild. And then the designers were kind of reusing components from project to project and kind of incorporating them back into that UI kit. That didn't correspond with any saved dev time. So 
by sitting down, we started doing user interviews, we started watching their processes, and we wanted to address more pain points than just a shared component system, and so that kind of set our roadmap off. But really what I think any good, like anyone should start doing is watching how the user current design system, I still do these once a month, I watch how the engineers use their component system, I watch how the designers use their design system, and I fix problems, I put things in the backlog, I change the roadmap, I adjust the components that we're building out, adjust the timelines for features, all based off of making our own internal organization work faster. Um, we got buy-in originally, and they, they were kind of like green light, don't worry about it, so we didn't need buy-in from like stakeholders, product managers, or anything like that, but just know that if you do need that, there are a lot of resources out there like saving time, money, et cetera, that you can find and use to get that. So the next thing I did was we sat down and figured out who the team would be. Um, there are a lot of different models. This is not mine. This is a really good recommended reading if you haven't by Nathan Curtis, Team Models for Scaling Design System. A lot of you are probably familiar with that, but essentially there's a solitary model, which is one person creates a design system and hopes everyone will adopt it and they don't really <laughs> look out and say, what does everyone need? The centralized model where you have a core design system team and then the surrounding teams adopt that design system that they're putting out and then a federated model. Uh, this is all about where is your organization at, how are your team structured, how are your projects structured, and it really has to be custom to what your organization does. What we found works best is the federated model. Uh, we use it in a way that essentially our core design system gets used in all of our products and then every time a new designer has to come upon a new component, they'll flag it for incorporation back into the design system. So they're all contributing back into it and they're also all using it. So it's a cyclical process for us. The same with the developers whenever they develop a new component and we really like it, we flag it and it comes back into a centralized process. Um, but, and then we also, before we even started, we actually defined our goals. So this is also another good thing for buy-in. We have uh, specific product design principles at our company they are also kind of tie into our own product principles as a company, but, and they're pretty straightforward. We want our, and this is a hierarchy of like, when in doubt making a decision about your product, <clears throat> it's one through five, and this is a good guiding light for anyone trying to make decisions. First, we want it to be simple, clear, efficient, elegant, and delightful. How that translates into our design system goals is we wanted 100% adoption, hefty goal, but we're a small company, so manageable by us, maybe not by larger companies. We wanted to reduce time spent on client products by 30%. We actually um, did it by 60%, which was pretty great. Uh, easy to white label, so easy to take our component system and apply client brands to it. Mm -hmm. All of our work is like that solution for PetSmart has PetSmart branding on it. The hospital's brand is on the hospital product. None of our brand doesn't really get to surface in any of these, but we have like an underlying system that keeps our look and feel consistent, so you know it's a well-made product, but it's still their branding. And then we also wanted to improve design and developer collaboration. So those were our four primary goals that we wanted to meet. And then we wanted to plan our architecture. So this is kind of going back to our process. We did the user interviews with our team, conducted a visual audit of all of our products, finding out every component that was floating out there in the sea of products we had, choosing our tool. So we do a combination of Figma, which actually speaks to our internal tools through an API, um, it, basically we have theme files in Figma that like send colors, typography, and drop shadows and border radiuses back over to our component library that's backed by code and automatically updates it. Mm -hmm. That took a while to develop, obviously, that, and we also didn't get that until Figma rolled out plugins, but that is something that we do now, again, for your process. And then we also, how did we start? <laughs> we started with two people working on it from the design team and two people from the dev team. So it was me and a designer and the chief, chief architect and a platform engineer. And we sat down with all the research, everything we wanted, the list of components that we wanted to roll out first. And we said, okay, as a team, this is our focus for two months. And then once we kind of ticked off all those boxes, we released an MVP. Minimal MVP, that's kind of funny, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. We released an MVP to everyone else in the company. We let them use it for a month. We basically let it run on all the products and had them incorporate it. They came back to us with all the issues, and that's when we rolled out the federated model. So that's when we started saying, okay, here are the guidelines for how you contribute. Here's our system for putting in bugs or requests. Here's how we're going to decide what to prioritize and what to not prioritize. Um, and this worked really well for us. 
We are only a team. Um, I think there's 36 total. So again, 100% adoption is easy on a small scale, not on a large scale. And this does work for a team of six designers and 20 engineers, but maybe not for something quite larger than that. Um, but everyone does contribute on both teams back, even if it's the smallest component, like a new drop down interaction or the large, large components like date and time tickers. So that's how we got there. Again, like the lid, you change one color, it cascades everywhere. And the platform guys were really kind of instrumental in making sure that the code was structured well while we were focused on the structure of the design system and the components within originally Sketch and then Figma. So this is the overview of what we ended up creating. Um, essentially, we have a core design system. That's where we keep things like buttons, typography, the color system. Um, organisms are things like charts and date time pickers larger components, navigation systems. Mm -hmm. And we also have illustrations in there. So we have uh, easily white labeled like monotone illustrations so that they can pick up the primary brands, keyboard, browser mockup, Gmail mockup, things like that. And then the system level has a base theme. That's the wireframe theme. Base features, which have desktop, tablet, mobile layouts, and things like that. So that they have to do user management again. We've done it before. They can go site that. And then client product files have the client theme and the sprint files. And this took four and a half years. <laughs> For the first year, it was really just that UI kit. The second year, it was a sketch library of that UI kit between me and another designer. And then we kind of had the moment with the devs where we were like, how do we align this? How do we even start this conversation? Um, and that's when we sat down and formed that like central team started breaking down components, and then from there we did a component at a time after our initial release. So it just started with like, we did buttons, then we did input fields, then we did um, chips, then we did charts. And starting with the smallest components and building out over a long period of time, rolling each component out as we finish it, letting people use it, cycling back into it. Like there were, and we've also revamped, it sounds, maybe the death side was maybe a little bit easier because we probably revamped just how we even structure the design system from atomic design, moving into a component-based system to like a mixture of both when we moved from Sketch to Figma. Because we originally were using atomic design, that was that got terrible reviews. People were like, this is too complicated. We don't want to use this. So then we kind of revisited it. And even now we're still updating it. Like we just currently um, we started letting other designers at other companies use it and have started figuring out how to make it work best for people who maybe don't have access to our internal suite of tools. They don't have access to like the code side, but how might they use those design components? So it's been a long process, and I think what really helped us each step of the way was saying like, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Who is it for? And then listening to our users. If all of that sounds like it makes sense as designers, that should be your design process. But I think when design, designers design for designers, sometimes you might forget to incorporate that feedback into your process as an iterative loop. And that really served as like a game changer for us in our design system development. <clears throat> Some of the other kind of cool things that came out of that, that maybe wouldn't have if you just stuck with a normal design system to component system for devs, was that we actually built a platform. The chief architect was like, what are your pain points? And I was like telling the developers to fix padding or margin or border radius when they didn't inspect the box correctly or they didn't read my documentation. And so he actually built a platform on top of the code-based component system where designers can go in and edit those CSS properties. So you can actually go in and edit the color for the primary button of a client UI, change the base color of it, hit publish, and that would cascade through the entire staging environment of that client product, not the live environment, so that'd be bad. But the staging environment will actually auto-update with all of your changes that you make. So there's no more developer designer like you typed in the wrong pixels or whatever. We solved all of that too. Mm -hmm. And that's that with in combination with the component system and the design system communicating has really saved us so much time as an organization <coughs> and let us scale a lot faster with a smaller number of people. Because we are, I don't think we're technically a startup anymore. We're about six years in, but we are a small team trying to make it as a startup. And so that kind of way of increasing efficiency while decreasing work has been a game changer for our own company and our own path. And it's actually the process of this has allowed, like the C-suite at our company totally buys into design process, design first, like 
we're a design focused company now, <coughs> design lab. And so, and it's all kind of because of the collaboration system we built early on. Um, and then the last thing, it's probably not going to be a problem here, but some things I've heard in interviews was like, a design system limits a designer. <laughs> and I, I don't think that's true at all. It actually enables you to focus on the true value of the product. And just as an example, these are four different products, some notional, some real, that we built with the same design system. In this example of how those components are getting, um, they're all based off the same components. If you look closely, they have the same look and feel at the base level, but then they've been customized with branding or colors or typography in some cases. Um, and then these are some benefits we've seen and lessons we've learned. For benefits we've seen is just cohesive visual brand. While these are client branded, you would still believe they came from the same company. It improved our UX consistency because when we built out the component library, we also built out the best UX practices and we update those regularly when we learn issues with users. New skills and learning opportunities. So it provided actually opportunities for my team to specialize in design systems. So some of our designers who came in as just digital product designers are now design system specialists over time. And then it improved collaboration between teams going back to that dev design handoff and that shared language. And then lessons we've learned was uh, continuous iteration is key. I built the first design system with Atomic Design that everyone hated. <laughs> and I also changed how those buttons were structured until like 2 a.m., maybe 4 a.m. one night and they, everyone still hated them. I don't know. So the, we don't even, we're not even close to how that initial system was structured and we've gone through a lot of structures since getting it right. The other thing that we've learned was like, I think something we did that was a mistake in the beginning was looking at like Salesforce design system and Shopify's design system and getting overwhelmed and kind of confused about your own direction because they're doing something that works for their company and what their company does is drastically different than what we were trying to achieve with like a wireframe system that can work for client brands and the type of components we need and the industry we're in are very different than a checkout kind of mm -hmm. flow. <laughs> so we, we kind of did that in the beginning and we got pretty overwhelmed with like how will we ever reach that level of documentation and we ended up just cutting all of that out and focusing on our own products that we had already built and that helped us pave a path that was much more clear. And then the last one is that it's okay to release a work in progress. We released the MVP, got a ton of feedback that most of it was poor, <laughs> but they, and then we updated it a month later, everyone loved it and like everyone's raving about it and now every product we have is built off this component library and the design system and everyone uses it. We reached 100% adoption and like a return we've seen Financially, based off of just time saved, has been <clears throat> exponential. Um, and so now it's now this is the language people learn when they start in my company. Developers and designers. This is the shared language that they have to learn of on uh, So that is it. I can I don't know how I'm on time, but I'm happy to show pieces of it and how they interact with each other, if that's helpful, or answer questions. You have a couple, like one or two questions. I have a question. You said at some point that you do, you said that first you have the plugins from Figma, but it also said you do the handoff to the developers, and the handoff is not always like correct with what you were giving. How do you do that? What is the handoff process? Because that's always a downfall yes. in every project. Yeah, so it's been a process over time. So this is our internal tool where mm -hmm. these are actually, this is a code mm -hmm. based, like, so if I went mm -hmm. to this table. Um, I can edit all the code here, mm -hmm. edit the properties, and they're actually using these variable names. So they'll, this mm -hmm. is actually the names for them that they'll use when they're calling these variables in React. And um, that'll show up there. And what we've done in Figma is during our handoffs, we not only, most of these are internal products, so it's pretty far along, but they'll pull on this table, this table automatically pulls in our styling. Um, and they're kind of just looking at the variable names of this and automatically adjusting them while they're developing, because those map to each other. So as long as our variable name and our Figma mockups matches the variable name as our internal product, that's kind of the new handoff method. And if anything changes, like the client was like, I actually don't want a purple button, or I actually need to change the secondary button to gray. You can do that here, and it'll automatically show up there. So we actually don't really do any more super in-depth front-end handoff. It's all just naming convention based and being aligned on our vocabularies. 
The other thing that's important, we generally have videos for more complicated interactions, so we'll give them video prototypes and things like that to mm-hmm. base it off of. But that hopefully answers your question. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's kind of cool is that, so this is our theme file, mm-hmm. and this is what gets pulled into here. Mm-hmm. So this actually will update here with the everything that's in this brand new section updates automatically from Figma. So if I change the theme color in Figma, it would update here. <laughs> Took a while. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Nice. Cool. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna get lab plugged in and uh, we're gonna the laptop a little closer for the folks with about twenty five people online. And uh, I'm gonna stand up for a second and stretch for a second and then we'll uh we'll get the last talk. shared understanding about. That's the key thing. If you don't have shared understanding, like, hey, how about design system? Hey, how about the component system? Like, is it the same thing or not? The most important thing, it should be the same thing. Um, so, same language, communication, I'm struggling with it, but basically design system is everything. Everything visual relates to communication of your product or services to the audience, <coughs> internal, external. Everything could be included in design system. Everything, I'm telling you. So, like, if you want to give design system like complete set of standards, quantum library will be components, style guide will be uh, tutorials, and it's basically, you know, like a brand book. You have all the rules how to use stuff about brands, so design system is, is a brand book for everything. All right? And those are not my smart words in every you see that gray link? You that's go online cool. later on. Yeah. That's the, that's the source of the, so you can brag about that significant source in your company. <laughs> not like just flat or like that. <laughs> uh, another picture, uh, I think it's beneficial to see other pictures and structures of that. Style guide, instructions, building blocks, uh, minimal elements, probably something more complex, rules, or that kind of bureaucracy that we love. Um, so, the most popular design system, material design, bunch of stuff, super confusing. If you go there, you don't know where to grab a button. Like, I'll give you five minutes to find a button on the website. If you win right now, I'll give you a price. Just start right now. Um, I like design system, public design system, but like transparent. And for example, clarity. Um, I forgot, what's that? Clarity is, uh, I forgot the, the owner of that, but UX guidelines, HTML, CSS framework, and Angular components working together. Cool, everything's simple. 
right? You can use it. Or maybe not. Can you use it? If it's open, can you use it or not? Yeah. Oh, my camera. You could. <laughs> you could keep going. Just, I'm a cameraman. Go. So, if it's public, it's not every time you can use it. That sucks. You can learn from it, but not use it. Um, for example, Atlassian. Can you use Atlassian system for your needs? Uh, probably not. But it's cool that Atlassian shows us that basically design system website is a product of itself. You can put some stuff about open positions, about your logo type, the open thing, please. The logo type, make it easily downloadable for your website. The, the best and first thing you do as a designer, let's publish our logo assets on our website. Plus more, my pirate, cool. Really, cannot imagine if I go to some organization that's sponsoring me and finding their logo online in SVG format is really hard. So, at last end, okay, this is our product, this is a marketing, this is our brand. They basically use that design system website as um, another, another website of the company to attract what they need, and you can merge with marketing needs about that initiative and you know, got some support, yeah. Um, IBM. IBM is big, clumsy, but cool. Right now they are cool. IBM open source. Open source, you basically can use it, but check the license. Anyway, the super kind of transparent left side navigation, click, find element, you're good to go. I like it. So, design system is a bunch of stuff, but if you need a list, here's a list on boarding, documentation, education, training, some basics, uh, code base and style configuration, components library, um, those components coded, and those components drawn for designers. Then patterns, uh, templates, examples, blog about your design system if you're really cool, news archive, versioning, kind of important, and support for your team because not everybody is so, so cool about design systems, they might not know how to use stuff. You need to provide the support. My idea is that design system is a product. It's not something easy. It's not something like let's work for one week, two weeks, three weeks, it will be done, never done, never easy. But you should do that. All right? Uh, my favorite will be Blueprint. Open source, the fashion <coughs> license. Uh, you can just take everything they've done and use it. It's uh, like this. You have all your components on the left side, theme switch, nice search, nice instruction for developers. It's React. React is kind of standard right now. You have some sketch uh, files. You can import those sketch files to uh, Figma or XD. And your developers can go right now, take the uh, copy, which is a fork of that design system, and start using it for your needs. Basically, it will be the same thing with IBM and any other open design system with the appropriate license. So it's a nice hack to don't do a bunch of stuff that Hannah's team did for their own needs. It started something already ready, but, but you will need, you know, it's a trade-off. Either customize things and learn things or do like everything from scratch. Emotionally, for developers, it's much easier to do everything from scratch. It's also super interesting. Uh, because learning something and customizing something like, oh, it'll be a bunch of limitations. For example, you can offer your developer to use Bootstrap right now. Right now, it's, no, 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 it's not, it's not cool. Bootstrap, <laughs> customize, no, no, no. So, there are cool things right now, for example, Blueprint. Uh, it is by volunteer, that's why it's cool. It's also only web-based for now. Uh, they're not looking to make it like mobile and it's for data heavy applications, not like marketing oriented or something. That's it, the first part done. <laughs> nice. Right, cool. Now, how to organize it? Not necessarily in Sketch. I like Sketch. I don't understand you guys using like, how many Sketch? Let's like survey. All right, 99%. <laughs> Figma. Almost nobody. And XD? Less than nobody. Actually? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually? Actually. All design and action? Yeah. You got the prize right away yeah. to be so weird that I couldn't <laughs> go back. This is a sketch pin for you. You got it. Actually, that's awesome. Interactions. 
for everything. <laughs> no doubts. There is an Envision, Envision Studio. I've never used it, but yeah. anybody from you? Yes, sir. Envision Studio, cool. All right. All right. Uh, okay. Um, five things to remember about design system organization. Versioning, <coughs> things will change. Four years. <coughs> you see, four years is a big time. Everything will change. You gotta figure out versioning. Then you have to go step by step, little step by little step. Don't try to do a bunch of stuff at the same time. Uh, make it accessible. That's my favorite. Make it because I'm not about accessibility. Yes, it's important if it's a, like an requirement for you, great. But I'm telling accessible for people to use it. For example, let's take <coughs> hypothetical company and name it Cisco. <laughs> <laughs> they do have an amazing design system, super expensive designers, like huge team. But if you are a contractor who would do something for Cisco, good luck having access to that. You just, oh, I found PDF, let me copy some styles. That's, that's your level. So please make everything public, available. It's super cool, you can use it like Atlassian for marketing needs, and uh, you can publish like visual parts publicly, and then code could be somewhere privately, that's okay but just give opportunity to other people across the organization. If you have more than, let's say, 20 people, please make it publicly available. Or super easy to log in under your, uh, what was SAML or OpenID or something, but uh, probably just publicly available. Nobody gonna steal it because you have a license. If they steal, you can earn money. It's cool. <laughs> All right? Um, since it's a product, put the person in charge, like Hannah, find your Hannah and put her in charge. It'll be, oh, we have three people taking, taking that, no, nobody. So one person, if they don't understand anything, but just make them in charge, they'll be better than three amazing people in charge. And uh, keep in mind that it shall help you to deliver a thing, not prevent you from that. So if it's preventing you, if your design system is like, blockage or of delivery or something, it's kind of badly done. And you're still like, oh, design system, no, never again. <laughs> so please, please support the brand of design systems for all of us. Um, now, in details, versioning. You have versioning in your tool. If it's not enough, uh, you can read that amazing article uh, from Clay agencies and top agencies in San Francisco how to organize files uh, in a design agency. Basically, it's a huge article about how good can you be with naming and structural, and naming convention is the minimal thing to keep your versions right, know that final, final, again, final. And, um, <laughs> and it's not so hard, it requires some, you know, diligence. You can use uh, tools like uh, Simply, they wrote out updated version of the website, you can check it out. Um, they basically allows you to compare two versions visually. So that's cool. Uh, if you don't like any of the versioning, just uh, join developers, be cool with them, and you don't need to learn common line, that black screen stuff. Just use some graphic user interface for, uh, for Git, GitHub. Uh, it's uh, GitHub uses Git, GitLab uses Git, everybody uses Git. So it could be Source 3, which is free. If you're a Mac user, it could be Tower. Nice application, basically inside, it's nothing so complex. You'll learn it like in two hours, and you ask developer, hey, help me learn Git. They're like, oh yeah, I'll help you. <laughs> and just like, again, bonding thing with your team. You just give one comment and click uh, commit and push. That's it. Yeah. It's simple. And go back to the version is also simple. This is basically two comments you'll, you will learn. You don't need to freak out about all the variety of uh, comments there. Uh, easy, simple. But if you don't want, there are other ways to support that. Um, start from simple, it could be just a grid with, uh, with your components, and it could be a bit bigger grid than a bit bigger grid. <laughs> start with buttons. Buttons are the core. 
like driving everything, you'll remake them multiple times. Yes. For example, if, oh, I have a button, then I have a like a secondary button. Oh, a button with an icon on the left and an icon to the right, and la 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 la, like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you'll have a dream. Everything is a button. And then you have a bunch of stuff, and you know, at that stage, probably think about uh, make those components in Sketch or how do you call them in, in Figma? Uh, components. Components. Oh, in Sketch symbols. <laughs> no, they have components. They have components panel right now, so it's like kind of the same thing. And it's there yeah, now. Um, so the most important thing it is boring. All right. It is boring. Design systems are boring. <laughs> no cursing, right? I would, I would play something. Um, general advice. If you do something in your design system, so show it all. Show it all like this. So you're like, oh, let me zoom in. And easy to find. Name things right. So show all, uh, like, right, this is the, um, this is the blueprint uh, sketch file uh, for the library I showed you. Basically, you spend some time as a designer, you have a header on the, le the left and then components on the right. And just all, all giant canvas. It's much easier to estimate what you need and zoom in and grab that component. Um, then name things right, at least groups, not layers, that is like copy, 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 but groups, kind of inputs, selections, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Spend some time, it's not super hard, probably it's one hockey away from you, comment R, how it's in Figma, comment R. Oh, she does. I just use the sidebar, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> yeah, use the sidebar, yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Um, keep styles organized. Yeah, it's annoying, it's boring, but you know it's boring, just keep it organized, name them. Uh, this will be a styles, um, text styles and sketch. We'll save you tons of time. Colors organized, styles organized text, layer, you know, uh, and then symbols. Symbols goes last, don't freak out about them. I decided to help to symbolize uh, the giant library of uh, Blueprint, just make super boring thing, not created at all, make all of the things in Blueprint with symbols. So they already done, they're amazing, expensive designers, people are like, you know, volunteer to come up. They have super talent. They already have styles, colors, everything organized. And I thought probably it'll take me like a couple weeks to symbolize all that, make it like elastic, mastic, and super cool to use. And they'll, you know, they'll be glad. And I like that system. I'll be happy too. Uh, March of the past year, I started. Didn't finish yet. Oh. <laughs> but again, it's not full time. You know, the distractions probably will be a full time. It would take me. 300 hours maybe full time to do all this stuff because I'm kind of you know start thinking like as a developer oh what if that what if that and then uh, button with that and left button like on the left right top button then like a minimal and let's go so basically it will be gigantic drop down with the components like this and items and all that stuff uh, kind of like this your design system could be kind of like this. Probably yours is kind of like this. Maybe not like this organized, but when you do uh, symbols and sketch, they are automatically like this. So you can grab them without copy paste, but you can just from the menu paste them right away. Mm -hmm. um, naming in sketches like this, all the hierarchy it, it is in the name. I don't know how it is in other tools. How you keep the hierarchy of uh, components? It's similar, but you can group them by art. Yeah, yeah, kind of the same thing. It will be a separate place where you have all your actual like symbols or components. Uh, but it's not the same as having one canvas where you put everything done stuff like in a nice aligned way. It could be the same, but it's not. So, um, again, keep all of those symbols organized. Uh, this is a place where everything automatically attached, but you actually can change um, layout there and make it kind of easy to work with. Um, and help yourself with some utilities. For example, uh, for years I've uh, gone through Google and like, hey, what's the mouse pointer cursor? Let me download that PNG. And then if you stop for a second, like, come on, 
I'll spend 30 minutes and I have something which is helpful for you. Maybe all of the logos of my company will be in one, one place or all the courses or maybe some important instructions. You can use that uh, design system to store that important stuff there. If you're a sketch user, probably use those uh, plugins. They will help you a lot. Move a bunch of stuff, rename a bunch of stuff in the batch mode. Uh, Rhino Pro is a really nice one. Uh, Chartful is a really good plugin to draw charts right in Sketch from data. Um, and to find some styles because it's a gigantic library, it's not easy to visually navigate through everything. And uh, if you find any helper, uh, we'll, be, we'll save you some time. That's it! <laughs> no, I'm, I'm lying. February 20, tomorrow, I'm organizing an event about US news design system. I will not speak there. That's already 50% of success. But we'll be four speakers talking about uh, US news. It's a publishing company. It's not It's not general, name. It's, it's a company. Uh, February 27 will be product meetup about different, different aspects of, of business. Not only design, about money too. And March 18 will be Dream Visualization Workshop. It's amazing. All of you must be there. That's it. All of those for free. <laughs> questions. Any questions? Each question got some little prize. You stop me if. Okay, one question will be nice, beautiful pink from Sky. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. 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 Do you use the same design system files when you start pretty much any project, or do you evaluate the original design system files when you're beginning a project with a new client? Depends on the client, their needs. Rarely when you start, anybody thinks about design system. Maybe in your case, it will tell us. If it's a big client, probably you can talk about that. But if it's a small client, MVP, startup, they don't think about the design system. You just, if you give them UI kit and you've uh, developed that UI kit in, in, in the application, there's a separate page with all components developed, uh -huh. that's already enough. But you can go further to like, okay, we're gonna build a website with all components for further customization. But it's kinda, maybe after first year of working with them, but if you like, if you were gonna work on a, web, a new web project or something like that, would you? Is it a long term? Personally, around? just talking about like, let's say they hired you to do something. Mm -hmm. Would you just crack open one of your design file system, like your UI toolkits, and then just oh, use right one now? of those? Yeah. I would customize Blueprint because uh, Blueprint. it's just covering everything, and I don't, I don't really think that you should start from scratch now. It's okay to have a bunch of stuff not, not stylized. Because you have them ready, you know. At the end of the day, design is important, but the not like unique style is not so important. If you need to ship the feature like tomorrow, okay. and clients or the user has to click on the button, they don't care. It will be like twenty, like twenty pixel round button or five pixel round button. Trust me, it's not that important. Sure, it's important that you have all of the components, and then you can stylize those. Yes, it's kind of not like, oh, I'm not developing anything from scratch, but come on. People and companies already invested in, in those uh, libraries, so just adapt and use them. And you, you, you can pick right now, it's not only material design, come on, you can pick and, and customize and develop and like, instead of spending six months, you spend maybe one, two, and you got a solid thing behind you. Mm -hmm. And you can tell them, oh, I've developed that thing. <laughs> pay me for four months. <laughs> Next question. See, I'm pretty really honest. Yeah. Yeah. Your sticker. When it comes down to <laughs> when it comes down to accessibility, where do you normally do this? Do you do audits within the design system, or do you only wait until it's code? Or is that something that somebody else deals with, and not yourself? It uh, depends on what time you got that requirement, and how real is that? Is it just for the paper or for the check mark? was really you are care about accessibility. I see. So if it's like for a check mark, probably just label things appropriately and you're good to go to pass some automatic tests. Maybe it's easier to solve that issue on the development side without even thinking on 
well, visual things. But if you're like, okay, we gotta check that and that and that, we're gonna bring, you know, five disabled people who are really gonna test our website and if they need high contrast version or maybe they just need nice labeling or maybe the layout should be different. It's not every time about, oh, we are keeping standard of uh, size of the font and contrast level. It's not only about that. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately or fortunately, sometimes, you know, you just need to change the layout inside in the code. So it's more complex issue than like, okay, designer, uh, you like minimal font sizes like this or like this. Other questions? No, that's it. Um, in your documentation, do you find it's useful to label where in the library something is? This guy fell out when you're talking about the component itself. So like, here's all the you know the rules about the component. Here's all the uh, codes that we should know. And, and the website website is just not only how to use for developers, but also it's a nice quick search and dim switch. So you can show things dynamically on the website already implemented. And um, usually it's easier to find visually some stuff in, in a sketch or a figma file that is just like a gigantic board. It's not so hard. You just zoom in, uh, you, you know, search things and like button, okay, I'm on buttons and I visually locate them. But when you are designing, like, oh, I need a select, which will be with, you know, big version of that minimalistic design, and I need to paste that in my code. It's better be a website with a search. Yeah, naming convention will, will help you, but have a system, some protect with, with, with a simple password. And like, okay, this is the library for that client, and there will be a drop down like version here, uh, like here. It could be another drop down like client or something. So, as hard as possible, put everything on the website and uh, Blueprint, they just, on the one like resources section, they put two, uh, two sketch files, but you can go far beyond and you can put sketch in, in each section or sketch artboards or any kind of artboards. Yeah. Yeah. It's up, up to you, but please just put them at least for designers and developers. Um, can you use Git to exclusively for notifying any changes um, or? Sketch right now has a cloud library, Figma, I believe, too. If you change anything in the library, it kind of automatically changes. I'm not sure how you control the version of that, but it's like if you're in a big organization, probably you don't want to pull some kind of update right away. You want to check it out. It could be, uh, I believe, I don't really trust in notifications. I switch off them everywhere. And I trust for like human need. And when you have a need, you go to a particular place where you can satisfy that need. And in that place, it should be easy to find. So if it's like versioning for you in Git and everybody knows that, you can just go, oh, I need that version. Or, or oh, this is updated. Let me read about it first. I, I don't have out updates in my iPhone. I like read like notes for, for versions. But if you don't care, uh, like you want the latest stuff and the latest and greatest, just uh, tools by default, I believe Sketch, Figma, I'm not sure about it, but you can suck the remote library right away and be always in sync with it. Thank you. Other questions? Um, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. So this is you guys are the first ones to see this one. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this is it. Uh, so why listen to me? Um, over the last, last eight years, I've led teams to build more than ten design systems for enterprise and Fortune 500 companies. 
Um, I've led external teams, internal teams, hybrid teams, uh, you name it. I started my design career working as an architect for eight years. Um, I went to University of Maryland School of Architecture for undergrad, and then I did my graduate thesis out at SciArc on uh, robotics and architecture. I actually worked on building kind of transformable spaces. And while I was doing that, I was building a lot of websites and stuff like that to supplement my income, and that was kind of the way that I transitioned from uh, working in the architecture world into doing all this digital stuff. Um, since then, uh, I've been working in the digital industry for the past 14 years. Uh, I started out working for a big agency out in LA called Schematic, which is now Wonderman Thompson. Um, and then I started my own agency in 2009. I ran my own agency for 10 years, uh, working on all kinds of projects and, and really seeing the landscape of the whole digital realm especially with big companies, really change over time, uh, which you'll see today. Um, and then now I, uh, I started this new company, M Digital, with a really talented, uh, amazing uh, friend of mine. And so we're attacking these really big, complex, hairy problems that uh, big enterprise companies have. Um, and we're trying to do it in a unique way. And so I'll talk a little bit about how we're doing some of that today. Um, so, so what does it mean to create a design system right now for a big company? With one product, it's pretty easy. When you have more products, of course, it gets harder to keep everything coordinated. Simultaneous customer research, product development, and a design system to keep everything coordinated. Uh, things are really getting complicated. Then you layer in brands and platforms, devices, and everything else, and things can get really overwhelming. So I thought I'd just start out with just a show of hands. Uh, how many of you guys feel like you're all the way on the left right now? Single product. Okay, perfect. And how, how is everybody? So looking back, I mean, I really learned a lot over the last, I mean, 10 or 11 years. And so I, I sat down and I was like, I want to make a brand new presentation and I want to, I want to think of things that I, I think really matter, having worked on a lot of these different systems. And, and I want to do it in a way that everybody can kind of remember some of the, the groupings, if you will. And so these are the ones that really came to mind for me. Um, momentum breeds sustainability. Definitely in large organizations. Uh, be, be strategic to leverage your resources. Uh, that's a huge thing, and there is an art to being strategic, and I want to talk a little bit about that. And then the last thing is that design systems are, are not design culture. And I think a lot of people really, they think that design systems are a silver bullet for changing your organization, and it's so much more than that. I mean, it's really the system of design um, that you really need to pay be, be really mindful of. Um, so momentum breeds sustainability. Momentum is everything. Everything you work on should be about building momentum. Don't Let's start with a design system. I mean, I, we've heard that twice tonight, and I think that's great, great advice. Uh, start building momentum with your customers and use their positive feedback as reinforcement to build momentum in your organization. And really think about things in terms of months, not years. And so the way that we recommend, I actually had some other slides where I, they were a little bit more of like the institutional you know, talking about how teams are organized and what was the whole thing about design systems and how things should be organized. I would just say that the way we really like to start with projects is we like to start on a eight to 12 week project. And we like to start by redesigning one product. Ideally an important product that's not performing well. Um, someone that has a, an, a product that has a big audience but just maybe looks terrible or functionally it's not really where it needs to be. Just really put the effort into actually redesigning that product. Um, so for Marriott, you know, it was making their new mobile app. That was the first project. Uh, for Lucian, it was uh, redesigning a global all-in-one solution for, you know, they saw a lot of applications to universities, but uh, this particular application handles registration and grades and planning and financing. Uh, finances. Uh, for Sony Pictures Entertainment, it was, you know, I got to work with the Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy team to actually build the, the kind of genesis of the new digital asset management system. Um, and so, you know, it, it was really about end-to-end -end solution for the, that particular customer segment. Um, and then for h &P, it was about creating an initial user experience for all the guys that manage their drilling rigs across the United States. So I'll show a little bit of that stuff today. Um, just pick one project and use that to start. Um, I like to call this time period the foundation because we're really starting to build the initial building blocks and the momentum we need to build uh, amazing products and transform the company from the inside out. Uh, I recommend that this initial foundation project is guaranteed. So like, don't, don't labor over all of those components at the get-go. 
Um, once you've realized your first product, now it's time to really open the design process up to more of the team. Um, and so Hannah did a great job of kind of talking about that, how you could start out as like an individual and then move into a central, you know, centralized mod model versus federated model. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit in this presentation about how I like to do both, which is kind of like a different version of what, what you have, and it works well for big organizations. Um, but you know, this process, especially at big companies, can take anywhere from three months to six months to a year to two years. It just depends. It really depends on the company. It depends on the size of the organization, all the products that you actually need to, to, to redesign and kind of test against the design system. Um, working on more than one product forces the teams to confront real issues on tools, styling across elements, standardization, team scheduling, research best practices, time management, and other important topics. You know, I don't, I don't go into any project saying like, this is the way that something should be. I think it's really important that you like live in the culture of a company a little bit and understand the way that the culture is because you're gonna have a much better you're gonna have much better traction if you understand where everyone is right now and talk about how you can uh, create kind of like stepping stones to move the organization and kind of do it kind of systematically. And it's even better if people don't notice things totally changing from this way one day to this way the other day. It's much better if you kind of do everything on on the DL. Um, and, and of course have fun with it. And then the, the last phase, I mean the reason why I wanna talk about all of this is just you have to understand that there is a whole process and with some companies it can take a year for things to just like be completely amazing like you could get through this whole process in a year other companies like giant companies it could take you know four years five years um, <coughs> but you know after you've kind of stress tested uh, your your initial like con concepts and some of your components and stuff like that uh, then you can get into some of the really fun projects and those projects are things that potentially live beyond individual customer segments or live beyond an individual product. This is where you get to like clean things up. You can create a design, you know, your own design system. You can start talking about omni-channel features. I mean, you can even go in and launch a brand new feature that's now going to work on all the different devices that you have. So I want to make it real. Like, you know, I, I went to the last one and I've been to a few of these and I, I do think it is important to talk about like real examples. So here's one really big project that I uh, that I worked on. Um, I've worked with Marriott for five years and I worked with the digital team uh, for four years working across all platforms uh, for their customer experience with this big goal that we're going to create a holistic vision across the entire company, across all the different devices of the entire company. The scale of this is like really insane. I mean, Mar Marriott.com is one of the biggest booking engines in the entire world. They have 500 million unique customers every year, uh, 7,000 uh, booking websites for individual properties, more than 7,000 on-property websites, uh, on-property TV, that's one of the biggest TV networks in the world. The, their mobile app, which right now is over 5, 500,000 reviews. Um, email, messaging, 30 individual hotel brands. And for uh, a whole year while I was working there, they had three loyalty brands that they were maintaining at the same uh -huh. time, which is an incredible project. Um, now they have one loyalty brand, so everything is kind of built around you know this one brand, which is great. And what's so amazing about that is that's just the customer side of the house. They also have on-property associate-facing experiences, internal websites, internal training tools for more than one million employees, uh, that so much more and all of this is on oh, more than 30 different brands. Uh, they have dozens of agile product teams, they have safe agile teams, they have local teams, global teams, distributed teams, they literally have thousands of people working on uh, all of these different platforms. So here's like here's the big goal right we have how are we going to make like a cohesive experience across everything? That's a great question to ask somebody because everyone's gonna be like oh my god like how how are we gonna build this new design system for this company that's like one of the biggest companies in the entire world same as what i was saying before like just start with one product and ideally start with one of the products that's not doing very well and and it's even better if you could start with a product that strategically makes sense and then also is something that you know is going to be a part of the future i mean pretty much every company i mean it's, i'm sure you guys feel the same way but Everybody starts with like the mobile redesign. I mean, that's where everyone's going. That's what that's the device in your pocket, the personal device in your pocket that you're using and you know matters to you. And so, 
uh, this project was a great first to, first project to kind of start on with this idea of the design system because it was a mini version of .com, uh, and it includes you know not only the future of the company but also all the core features across all the different services, and then also it it kind of nodded to and it needed to have a kind of we needed to make some decisions on how all these different brands can live inside of like a master loyalty brand, and this this project in itself was an amazing project. We're working with a famous, amazing design agency that worked on this and did fantastic work. There was a whole bunch of internal people. I worked on it, I helped coordinate the team and had a lot of creative input. And then there were a bunch of amazing stakeholders of the company that were giving a lot of feedback as well, including the person that was actually in control of this actual product. Um, the process was really collaborative. Um, I think a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, that it's all living in digital, but in, the, in reality, especially when you work with big companies, you have got to live beyond your screens. And so just as much as you can, create war rooms, create walls, create places to be able to put the work up so that different team members can actually come by and see things. In this case, we had a lot of different people that were actually contributing to this project. And so we intentionally pulled people from other teams that weren't even necessarily in the realm of this team to come in and have opinions on it for like the that was a, a new thing because you'd be like, you know, you work on a team that works on a specific product, you're, you're like pretty heads down, you know, hey, come over here. What do you think about this thing that we're actually working on? And out of the original mobile app, we uh, generated this first initial kind of design system. And I actually built like this file. And so uh, it had all of the original kind of components that go into the, the mobile app. And uh, of course, you know, you can see here, this is just like the very bare bones beginning of how this thing actually was created. Um, and so we, just like what I was explaining before, we, we stress tested it against a few internal projects after that, and we started getting some more traction. And then it was time to really test it and really see if it could turn into the thing that we were hoping that it would be. And so we started applying all of that work to the, the monster, to the booking engine. And that was a one and a half year project. I mean, over 300 plus responsive freight pages, 34 brands, over 7,000 hotel websites replatformed. All of this is on one single design system. Um, and so, you know, we have tons of contrib a, a whole team of people that were contributing to it, that were adding into this design system. And what you're seeing here is just a snapshot of uh, just some of the components and stuff that were part of the design system. And you know this is all built so that it can be used with 30 different brands as well. Um, and so, okay, so we got to a certain point. We applied it against against a really important thing, and we also uh, did all of this while the without impacting actual sales, which is like something that's really amazing because you know, God forbid, you actually mess up a button on the page and you don't you make less than 200 million dollars in one day. I mean, it's it's like with the when things go out. You lose millions of dollars, not like thousands of dollars, and we're talking like for an hour. <laughs> so it's it's a big deal, and so like uh, and it you know it can be high stress as well. But you know, thankfully there was such a great team working on it that it was it's just fantastic and it was a great project. Um, but once you start to get some traction and you're building that momentum inside of the company, then you have an opportunity to work on some of these really interesting projects. Which one of them is like. How can you enable all these different brands to tell their story within the same space? And that's a pretty unique thing to really talk about when you talk about design systems because a lot of people talk about theming design systems, but this is way beyond that. This is like how do you make it so that you can actually differentiate the products that you have uh, using different components in the design system to tell stories. And so, for example, you could have like kind of a baseline, some baseline components that you use, and then you can also have uh, other components that allow you, like if you have much richer content and more features and other things like that, you know, all of this is, is part of the overall design system. Um, but it's like you're you're able to kind of employ different uh, features and stuff in different areas to really tell that story. Again, don't make it like in the digital world. Make it into a physical world and look across the whole system. And then, kind of the the goal is to make it so that you know you could come you could be a, you could come in through the loyalty brand and everything will be loyalty branded you could come in through an individual hotel brand and everything should be individually branded it just depends on where you're coming in and so for example if you're having a certain affinity for a particular hotel type you know the your booking confirmation should be on brand your email should be on brand your website should 
be on brand, the booking agent should be on brand, the app, when you get there, like the building's on brand, so the on-property experience should be on brand, everything that's in your room should be on brand. Um, it's wow. just, it's the scale of it is just massive, I mean, really massive. Um, the second thing that I want to talk about is just being strategic to leverage your resources. Um, so people, knowledge, production capability, subject matter, expertise, I mean, all the companies now, the big companies, they really have that subject matter expertise. You name it, you know your company. Uh, you have to have a strategy to take advantage of all the resources, but it doesn't mean you have to uh, be explicit about your intent. I think it really does add a lot of stress to come in and say, hey, now we're gonna all work in a totally different way and we're gonna now use this design system. If you can, for as long as you can, don't talk about design systems. Don't talk about like transformational change. Like work on things like bit by bit, but don't come in and just be like, oh, we have this big plan and everything really needs to change. That's, that's just not a way that I would really recommend doing it because while you're kind of under the radar thinking about what you're, what, how things are gonna work and strategy and stuff, you can actually just, you could gain a lot of kind of positive power by I don't know, having some time to actually think about what you wanna do. But at these big companies, I mean, it, it, it really does matter what your what your strategy your strategy is going to be to realize your act, the design system or the efficiencies in design or efficiencies in the actual system or the culture of design at the company. Um, over the years, working on these different companies, I've really noticed three different ways that you can leverage resources at large companies. Uh, you could do it through a strategy to take advantage of customer segmentation for products and then also this kind of hybrid approach. Um, so I was working with one of the biggest drilling companies in the US for a few years, uh, flying around to all the rigs all over the US, and we were building this brand new product to enable uh, maybe half of their employees to be able to uh, do things in a whole new way. And so what we did is we, uh, we looked at all the different customer segments and we were like, oh, of course, we're not gonna work on everything at the same time. So why don't we pick up like our first project and make it something be a really meaningful project? And in this case, it was about finding, you know, it was uh, building a great product for you know half the company, and then we started to scale it after that. Uh, another strategy would be go after products. So like working with Lucian, uh, I had the opportunity to work with amazing teams there, just fantastic teams. Uh, we started off with Power Campus, which was kind of like a is a software that's a almost like a mini application of many different. <coughs> other applications all in one. And so we use that as kind of the beginning of the, the design system and then same process. We started with something, we stress test it, we start to scale and then we really scale. And then uh, when we talk about like, you know, working with Marriott, we started with the mobile app, stress testing it. Then we, uh, you see, you know, we started with, with working on the, the big booking engine and then we got into these really interesting projects that were cross product. So I wanted to show kind of an example of how the strategy kind of came to life, Sir, doing so crazy. <laughs> uh, how the strategy kind of came to life with this drilling company. So, um, so I worked on this, this really fun project because it was with, it was with, uh, with a target audience of people who hate technology. I mean, uh, I say all of this very lovingly. These guys are amazing, really amazing. And you know, I went out every month for two years flying around the United States, going to all these different rigs and meeting all these amazing people with these amazing stories. And, uh, and over time, like learning how to really downplay what it means to be a user researcher and make it more like I'm just some schmo at IT, like low level, doing whatever I have to do because my boss told me to do this. But like going out there and really like getting in with them and like doing it the real way, like the real user research way. And so we used to go out, like I got a fire suit, I got all the stuff, I got all the equipment. So we went out and we would meet with these guys and we worked on building this kick-ass uh, internal tool. And uh, they had like all these different softwares that didn't work well together and it wasn't kind of comp comprehensively done. And so we came up with this whole new concept that the, the new uh, system would know who you are, what you do, and then it would customize the experience to help you accomplish your goals in faster ways. And so the initial project was to redesign certain parts of the application to make it so that you could uh, you know, that you could do your work more efficiently. And then over time, like all of this, and this project, I mean, this is kind of before people even really were starting to talk about design systems. You know, I had the opportunity working at a big, big agency a long time ago and doing my own stuff to work on a lot of cross-platform projects. And really the only way to keep the brand cohesion was to have a design system or some sort of kit of, kit of parts. Um, and so we just kind of started applying the same logic to this and 
you know, this stuff had to function when there's snow on the ground, high glare, over 100 degree temperature in, in Texas, tons of trips, Oklahoma, tons of trips. Um, and so, you know, this was for the original target audience and then we would scale that to the different groups. And so you're kind of like stress testing, is, if you will, against these different groups. So some groups use different devices and so it needs to transform. Other groups use really different devices and they're in totally different locations and they have different requirements. Um, and then once we kind of got through some of the individual uh, company facing stuff, then we started talking about actual client facing stuff and wanted to have everything built off of the same system. All right, the last thing, which is really important to me, is that design system does not equal your design culture. A design system is not going to fix the issues at your company. People think that you know design systems are really a silver bullet, but they're not. Culture eats strategy for lunch. And if you think about it, a design system is a reflection of the design culture at a company. And think about that a little bit when you look at people's design systems, because you can see like happy design systems with people doing, happy people doing great work. And they're happy and they care about their customers and you can see that reflected in the design system. You can also see like design systems that don't reflect that. Um, like it, it, the design system is kind of a manifestation of how well your design program is working at your company. Um, and so I think it's important that all of us like take it to heart that we make little changes in our organization because you do have the power to do that, to kind of like move things forward and build momentum. Um, you know, people, you talk about design systems and everybody's like, okay, well, you know, this is what I think a design system is. But for me, that's not what I think it is. I think that's just like the manifestation of really the team. And, you know, it's the team and the culture that you create at your company that ultimately decides if you su succeed or fail with your customers. And the design system is a manifestation of your relationship with your customers. Um, I have been super fortunate to work with really incredible designers developers, design leaders, user researchers, you know, it's all about your process, it's all about your team. Um, I just thought I would uh, to just talk about a few uh, examples of some things that I think that every one of us can do to help transform our enterprise organizations. Um, the first thing, and this is a really important thing, is uh, create shared values. You know, the, the Elucian team created this list of shared values uh, and printed them out on these little cards and I actually can't so funny, they're gonna laugh at this. But I actually carry this card around with me because I actually really believe in all the things that are on this card. Um, and you know, remember your design system is gonna be a reflection of your design culture. So uh, you know, I, I believe in affirmations and the, the ability for them to change our lives. So I was just wondering if maybe you guys would read these things off with me and mm -hmm. maybe we could have a little bit of like an affirmation ourselves. So uh, I'll start off uh, and just come on, let's go. I strive to create excellent work. I am always curious and learning. I lead by proactively bringing solutions to the table. I give honest feedback because it makes our work stronger. I collaborate with other teams and I am always eager to offer help. I actively listen to others with the willingness to change my point of view. See, it does, it feels good. I, I look at it every day when I'm with people. Uh, align, on your, align on your shared goals. Uh, it's more than writing them down and sending them out. It's, it, you know, it's important that your team members actually meet. You know, when you have a thousand people working on a design program, you have to get together in a room and you have to really talk about your issues, your goals, the risks. You know, people want to be heard. People want to be part of this process. It really does matter. Um, I can't wait for us to move beyond the tools discussion because it's just <laughs> tools is just te it's technical and it's just like it's te it's tactical and it's just like it doesn't really matter what tools you use like I actually have to use pretty much all of these because we have different clients and you know if you work in a big organization chances are you have already have a giant deal with Adobe or a giant deal with Microsoft and you don't have really have a choice about some of the tools that you're going to be using so who cares don't even talk about it just make a decision move forward it's just they're all kind of merging into each other and eating off of each other's features anyway so it's just like let's let's talk about the real deal let's talk about design systems well, let's talk about customers really and solving customers pain points aligning on your schedules uh, for me I think this is really a pro tip and something that I think everyone should really go back and like look at again um, I think there's huge opportunities to optimize your schedule and I've been kind of beating this drum for many many years 
Uh, we do not have enough work time. I'm sure everyone that works in big companies is in meetings all the time. I know that the longer I work with a company, the more, the closer I get towards 40 hours of meetings every week, and then everyone having to do the work after hours, which is like totally crazy. But like, you could do crazy stuff. You could like, let's say you're on an agile team, like, okay, whatever, please don't put your start and finish date on a Monday and a Friday. But if you have to do that, you could do that. But like, what if you had a culture where everyone knew that they could do cross team meetings on certain days of the week, and then the other days were totally dedicated to working on your agile team work? You could get a lot done. You would not be, you not have all these distractions and meetings come up. Um, just check it out. See what you can take off your schedule. I. Uh, I have this weird screensaver thing and I was just reading it yesterday and it said, try changing all your meetings for one week to 30 minutes, every single meeting and stick to it for one whole week and see what happens. And I haven't done it yet, but I'm trying. Um, I'm almost done, I just have a couple more slides. Um, align your design, your, align your uh, design system, will you treat your design system as an actual product? Um, I have had really a lot of success with this model or different versions of this model over the, the years. Uh, I think of design system as like, okay, yes, that's like the manifestation, like it's the physical artifact that you're actually creating, but you need like some sort of unified experience team or a team that is actually kind of managing it. So we talked about it, the, the centralized model and versus the federated model. Uh, I believe that the team should be bringing all of the different components to, to, the, to the centralized team to, to kind of evaluate all that stuff. And I'll talk about that in a second, but it works super well if you can kind of build an, a core team that, okay, keep management to a minimum, but you have a shared, uh, a mini team inside of there that's building your shared components. You have a team that's actually working on your future vision and they have their own research program that's actually within the team. So just like all your product teams are out in the field doing research, your your actual system, your system team, user experience team is doing research as well on future vision. And then sometimes they're doing research on cross product design system stuff. And then the, the other thing is accessibility and governance. Uh, I take it super seriously, and it is something that is is just it is is mandatory with every project that I work on because like we it's like lawsuit territory. Like pretty much everybody's had lawsuits at this point, so nobody wants to have that be an issue. And accessibility isn't just getting like your colors to be compliant with your contrast ratios. There's so much more to that. Like if you want to really get into it, like try to make PDFs accessible and try to make your PowerPoints accessible and your Word documents and really look at what it means to build like semantically like build things like the correct way so that they are actually accessible. It's like a totally different thing. Um, align on your working model. Uh, I just the Lucian team is just crushing it. I mean the team is just really doing a great job. They enable all their product designers to attend a weekly meeting every single week. They allow team members to make suggestions <coughs> on new components based on customer needs. It's on an as-needed basis based on customer needs. Your design system should not <coughs> include any components that are not customer focused. Just, it has to become from, be born out of research, tested and proved out of research and brought to the team. Like, this is a solution that, we, that our customers want. Uh, and then allow space for an honest discussion to happen, you know, kind of like we talked about with the core values. And just enabling each team member to have a voice, it just, it matters so much. Like, it's not necessarily possible to do that on the first day, but like if you start to really impact the culture and you make it so that people can start to have a voice, you just won't believe how, where you can go you know, in a single year. And, and just, you have to also know that some voices are going to be louder than other voices, and the collective whole is really just gonna be as good as your weakest link. And so just think of this as an opportunity for junior people to even be mentored by some more senior people and to learn a lot of stuff, even learn about the process. They, wa they want that, they're like hungry for that anyway. So just in retrospect, uh, momentum, you know, in recap, create momentum, be strategic, play an active role in your design culture. You don't have to have management actually do that for you. Um, and I have to just say, like having worked on all these projects, I have to give a shout out to all the talented people that I've had the opportunity to work with. I, I can't just go through names because I'm going to not name some people by accident and it's like more than 100 people across all these different companies. But just you guys, and you probably many of you are watching in there, but like you made it really re rewarding for me and I just, I really appreciate it. Uh, this was like a funny event that we did where uh, I wish my hair was like that, but <laughs> anyway, I was like doing this event. But uh, 
Anyway, what did I miss? I think we're gonna do a little QA, but just uh, please reach out to me. I would love to have a coffee with you guys if you want to talk about design systems. If you need any help with anything, just let me know. Um, I I'm all about meeting people this year, so let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was actually before I worked with them, so now. And also, uh, where we were going was very remote, like some some cases quite remote, and so uh, it was kind of like whatever was there. Oh, that's why you got married, because you didn't have that experience. Totally, <laughs> I, totally <laughs> unrelated. I mean, I, I started working with, with Marriott just on such a small project, just to start, and then, you know, five years later. Any other questions? Yeah. In the discovery process, when it comes down to design systems, do you try to generally tend to go to good field? The reason I ask you about this, I've been on projects where people would be talking about stakeholders about having a design system. The entire overall strategy changed so quickly, it was really hard to keep up. Uh -huh. I, you know, I really just, I believe fundamentally, maybe it's because of my background and just architecture and also working for big companies and stuff like that. I believe in like the design process of actually building products. And I feel like design system, like this is something I'm really passionate about because I really see the merit of, of it and what you can do with it. But it's, you know, I am a user research based product designer. Like fundamentally, that's what I am. Every project I work on is that. And even the way I describe any of the work that we do is it's a design loop built inside of a customer feedback loop. And the customer mm -hmm. feedback loop is the thing that we set up first. So, I mean, like, I, when we're working on some of these initial projects, I try not to talk about the design system stuff that much. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one thing that we also do that, that I personally care about is this whole gap between coming up with a new product design and actually realizing it. And so we always kind of pay close attention to that and we try to really do what we can to make it so that that gap is either super minimized or completely non-existent. Even going so far as to actually like train internal team members to be able to use the files and start to create the files while, while we're there and you can ask us questions and stuff like that. Any other questions? Back up. So you talked a couple times about getting out of digital, going to boards, there's lots of pictures of collaboration mm -hmm. on, on paper and post-its. Have you had any experience where you've had to deal with remote designers and distributed teams? And if so, how did you approach that kind of yeah, uh, I would say that's a good question. I think that we, there are a bunch of those kind of boards like here, but I think what I have really found is just trying to create a culture of people doing video chats on and off throughout the day. Like I find that to be, it's great for everybody. And they even have like, I was just showing my, my business partner, they have, you know, uh, Snap has that application that you can run that creates like an extra camera on your computer. And then when you go into Zoom, you, you pick that X, the Snap camera. And you can have like your mustache and all this stuff. Like you can kind of have like fun with it. And and I think that that's good to do because it's like you know the work can be grueling sometimes. So I just try to if we can't get together in person, then I take a lot of photos and I send it to the team, and then they can look at it and then they give me feedback in real time. Um, just one other thing with meetings, like I, I didn't mention this before, but. I really believe in set pre-setting meetings and not rescheduling meetings on any circumstance. Just like if you if the meeting doesn't happen, great, you have another one next week. Just like keep going. Like and so like with that kind of stuff, like you can almost guarantee that you're gonna talk with your other team members that are remote on a very ongoing basis and you're gonna get to know them. Any other questions? Yeah. Um you talked about the part of the issue of design systems being perceived as limiting the sort of creativity of design rooms. Um, how have you sort of communicated the opposite? Like, how do you coach it to the opposite? Like, how do you frame a design system as something that supports sort of a creative process? And Anna in her talk, I think, mentioned that, you know, it frees you to think of big problems. And I'm wondering how you perhaps coach a design team with a design system to see their, their world, the system in context of their world. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you have to have a play space to be innovative. And I think that when, you, like, when you're doing that, like, I, I try to just really focus on customer. It's all about the customer. And 
you know, making it so, like, let's say you're, you're an individual UX designer. You're working on your individual product. My product does X, Y, and Z for the customer. And so what I, like, I try to tell them, like, that your goal is to solve the customer's needs. Like, you have these tools. You know what the tools are. You know what's in the tools. But you shouldn't have to, you shouldn't feel limited by what's in the actual tools. Focus on solving the customer's needs. And so in many cases, like, you know, the, the design systems born, all the components are born out of the individual projects. Like, for example, at, uh, at Elucian, it's, it's so cool. I mean, they have this, this system where they have all these different products. You saw that, that, that photo there. This is just like, this is the design user research and uh, a couple of the developers on the standards team. I mean, they have a big design team. All these designers work on their individual products. And so they are innovating on their individual products. You know, they're innovating, they're uh, quantifying on their projects. They're, they're like, you know, making sense of the actual data. They're coming, they don't come to meetings with like a component that they think is gonna be something that should be adopted. They come, they love bringing in new components with the actual research to back it up and say like, this is, this is something we should really consider adding into the design system. Does anybody else uh, have an issue like this? And then other people will chime in, and sometimes you know the discussion will just kind of get out of hand, and then we have to move it on to the next meeting because, like, we still have to talk about it, but it's just, it's just not possible. Um, so, I mean, you're you're asking a good question, and probably I didn't give that great of an answer, but I think that it really needs to be built off of user research. Like, go for it, innovate, do what you do best. Good question. I was going to ask. Um, how do you get clients to buy in that sort of immersive sort of um, on, on, on site kind of research? And how do you mitigate that kind of like undercover boss kind of thing going on? Where you seem like, oh, it's, he's just an imposter, ask some questions and go, go away. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I try to be really accountable about stuff. And when I go in and work with different organizations, I try to do a great job. And usually it takes time to kind of build trust with different different people. I also, you have to be mindful of the politics that are involved in every company. And anytime you see two like bulls charging at each other, it's you really need to get out of the way because there's <laughs> no things need to get resolved, you know, the way that they need to get resolved. And it's not your job. And don't try to make it your job. Like, and I have been squashed a few times. And you learn from your left from that. Scammed or squashed? Everything. Everything. And it's been it's been really painful occasionally. But you know, you just I try really hard to just focus on the customer. Like how can if you're getting the real feedback from the customer and the customer's not lying to you, your people may not want to hear the results of what you have, but the results are what the results are. And so I try to just bring it from the customer's the user research perspective. I try to not get involved in the politics. Um, I try to actually listen to all the team members and try to like make like meet them and make friends with them and stuff. I mean, my LinkedIn is kind of getting a little out of hand because some of the bigger companies, it's like I'm starting to have like hundreds of people I know at individual companies and that has its own things. But uh, I, I mean, it just takes some practice, I guess. It's different with it. Every company is different. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for our speakers tonight. Thank you, Vixel, for having us. We really appreciate your time. No problem. This was a wonderful meetup. I'm totally in admiration of these incredible presenters. So thank you so much for, really for coming. Really job. Thank you. Uh, so next month, we're going to be talking about freelance, the business side of freelancing. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> next month, so uh, stay tuned. We'll post the event here shortly with the location and, um, and full title description and things. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, if you would like to be standing up here speaking, or if you're interested in hosting or sponsoring an event, we would love to hear from you. Um, just contact one of us through the Meetup site or on social media, we're all over the place. Um, we, would, we would love to hear from you, um, and we will see all of you at a uh, coming event. So thank you so much for coming today. Thank you.